Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to lecture guide number four, which is on the Northern Renaissance, um, 15th century, so the 1400s. And we'll start with just a little bit of clarification about this. You'll be hearing a lot, as you started to hear last week, <coughs> about the Renaissance. Um, literally means rebirth, as we covered. However, there is the Italian Renaissance, Obviously, it takes place in Italy, in these key centers, Rome and Florence, and to a lesser extent, Milan. And then later on in the quarter, we'll see it taking place also in northern areas of Italy. And then you also have the Renaissance taking place in northern countries of Western Europe. Um, and so what we mean when we say the northern Renaissance for today's lecture, um, it means the northern parts of what is today France, in an area known then as Flanders, which is contemporary Belgium. And then later on, when we come back to the Northern Renaissance, uh, we will add in the countries that are today Germany and the Netherlands in there. And it's slightly different than the Italian Renaissance for one big reason. So let's cover the context first. Uh, even though our first work of art, by the way, is a kind of late Gothic, early Renaissance work from France, and the big difference in the context is that while the Italians uh, are very interested in classical works of art and emulating classical styles, as we'll see in next week's lecture, in the Northern Renaissance, um, they're not so interested in Greece and, and certainly not the art. They're interested in the philosophy to some degree, but not the art so much. Uh, and their style, their period style, looks a little bit different because of this. However, the other key features of the context, as we talked about last week, are the same. We have a slow deterioration of the feudal system in Western Europe being replaced by uh, mercantilism and the middled, middle moneyed class of merchants and bankers who are the primary patrons uh, for the arts. And with this rise, of this middle class, of course, comes the rise of humanistic ideas about the importance of this world and perfecting ourselves and those around us. So, you know, for the large part, the context of the Northern Renaissance is much the same as that in Italy, and we've already covered that next week. Just take out of the equation the interest in the classical Greek and Roman styles that the Italians really like, because in the North, that's less important to them, as I've said. <laughs> so we'll pick up the period style and what are the components of the period style in the Northern Renaissance in a moment. But we start with a work of art that kind of hovers in between late Gothic or what was known as the international Gothic style and uh, these newly found interest in naturalism that run concurrently with the rise of humanism. The first work, which you see up here on the screen now, uh, is a an illuminated manuscript known um, as the Tre Richer, or the Very Sumptuous Hours, created by a workshop of the Limbourg brothers uh, in the area today that is basically northern France. It was created for an aristocrat, um, and so this is still part of the feudal system by and large. And so components of this work are very much in the old Gothic style, here particularly what was known as the international Gothic style. Before I get to that, let me explain to you what this type of illuminated manuscript was, and you can find out more details about this in your text reading. Um, books of Hours were, were illuminated manuscripts that were uh, composed and organized according to the calendar and the zodiac sign. And so usually two pages are devoted to a couple of months of the year. And alongside of the pictures, as you see here, were also text drawn from various parts of the Bible uh, that were keyed into particular types of rituals or prayers that were associated with particular times of the year. Now, again, this is like those medieval manuscripts, so it's not something that uh, you could go check out in the library or something. This was a book that was created as a luxury item for an incredibly rich patron, the Duke of Berry, um, for his own private enjoyment, uh, partially religious, but partially, a, and maybe even a large part, 
of this is that it's a luxury item, something that is a beautiful display of one's wealth and one's, uh, you know, culturedness and something that, sure, they would have read, but really it's something to show off to your friends and so forth. So the style here has nothing to do with what we'll look at coming up, frankly, at least in this page. It is of the international Gothic style, meaning that if you were to think of the types of sculptures that you saw on the cathedrals of the Gothic period, or even the imagery that is in the stained glass windows, it looks a lot like that. What I mean by that is these aren't particularly naturalistic figures. I'm going to zoom in close here for a minute. Right, so they don't look all that naturalistic. The, the figures, the faces, have a little bit of modeling, and those look partially naturalistic. But primarily what the artist is concerned with is creating a visual elegance in the picture. And so everyone's a little elongated. If you start to look at these hands, they're very, very elongated. They don't show much of a body underneath this drapery. The drapery's all in there just to show you these beautiful colors and designs and the types of fabrics that the aristocrats would have worn. And this, of course, fits in with these people. They're not interested in humanism. They all come out of the aristocratic class. They were born into their wealth. They don't need an emphasis on naturalism. They like the idea of you know, luxury and beauty and decoration. So that's not really all that important, especially in these pages. Now, what you're looking at here, and this is very common in this text, is a subject that is taken right out of the enjoyment of the middle, upper classes. And a feast scene with a jousting event in the background, right back here, with all these knights and the standards. And then up above that is a scene from the Zodiac telling you which part of the year that we're focused on at this point. What is most interesting for people about this particular illuminated manuscript are rather the pages that are devoted to lower classes, the serf or peasant class, because they alternate back and forth between scenes from the aristocratic class, very much in the international Gothic style, and other scenes that are of the natu more naturalized um, depictions of the lower classes and their toils and their labors of the month and what they do while the aristocrats are frankly enjoying themselves. And in these scenes, we see a greater degree of naturalism, and you'll be able to see these details more in your text, and I'll show you a couple of close-ups of this, but you can already tell this. Um, I'm going to get up close here. What we're looking at, basically, is something that should look suspiciously like a Jado work. Uh, up here in the foreground are women kind of warming themselves in front of the fire after working outside. The architecture is wonky, right? It doesn't look like a real building. He's cut the face off of it, and the perspectival lines are all kinds of wrong. This doesn't look real, because he hasn't really learned this stuff yet. And yet the figures themselves uh, start to show bodies underneath those drapery and a greater degree of naturalism to them. Uh, the scene over here has, you know, the, the, the livestock and the, the chickens and beehives over here. Uh, up here is someone cutting wood and someone taking things off to market in the far distance. You know, it's a bit different between these two scenes. It's as if the artist decided to represent the aristocratic class in the style that is most associated with aristocrats, that gothic, very stylized, very decorative uh, flat style. And then when he turned to represent the lower classes, he was much more interested in the newly emerging naturalism that would have been found in the 15th, uh, 15th century, the 1400s. Remember, we've jumped forward almost 100 years from Giotto because, as your text points out, there's not a ton going on uh, in the later uh, half of the 1300s, the 14th century, because of the plague hitting Western Europe actually move back here for a minute and show you some close-ups of this so that you can see that great greater degree of naturalism, right? Um, so you can see bodies underneath this clothing. You can see a much more uh, 
more, much more attention to the, the naturalistic re rendering of the faces. There is no elongation of the body or emphasis on decorative patterning. We're trying to show them doing what they're doing. Now, with that being said, you can probably tell as well, you know, um, they're pulling up their dresses, something that no um, aristocrat would ever do in showing their undergarments. This is a way, frankly, for the aristocrats to point, uh, poke a little bit of fun at the uh, lack of manners and decorum of the lower classes, who, of course, they are controlling and ruling over. This is the general program for this entire beautiful manuscript. We see again a couple of these pages left uh, aristocrats going out for a hunt, all dressed elegantly, all on these, you know, incredibly stylized horses. They don't look anything like a real horse. No one's bodies really show underneath this drapery. Everything's been turned into a decorative patterning. Same thing over here on the right-hand side, if you were to look at this gorgeous castle in which these aristocrats live in. But if you look at the foreground of this, and I'll get us in here a little closer on this, you can see a greater degree of naturalism. All the people have bodies underneath this clothing. There's no emphasis on decorative patterning. They're just toiling away at their everyday work, supporting the aristocratic classes. The thing that I wanted to spend the most time on, because now it's a little bit familiar to us, is a devil page spread, which is why it's so kind of cut down the middle here. Uh, so it would take place in the fold of the book. Uh, which is a scene from the Garden of Eden, which we looked at when we looked at the bronze doors of Bishop Bernward earlier on. And much of the subject matter is the same, and its emphasis on the fault of Eve and her temptation is the same. Although here we get an even kind of clearer articulation of the sexuality of this scene. This is a, a type of scene that is known as a simultaneous narrative. It's a relatively new term for you. A simultaneous narrative means that within a single frame, in this case a double page spread, we have multiple different moments represented uh, from a particular story. So there are scenes, for instance, over here on the left of Eve being tempted by the serpent, serpent then Eve tempting Adam. Then on the right-hand side of this, we see God catching them and being angry with them. And then over here, we see the archangel Michael in this red angel form expelling them from the Garden of Eden. So four different kind of, you know, scenes from the story of the temptation and the fall of Adam and Eve, all placed within the same scene itself. That's called the simultaneous narrative. Look at some of these up and talk about what we're seeing. In this stage, we do, with the exception of the architecture, have a greater degree of naturalism in the representation of these bodies. He's trying to make them look like real bodies, and he's using modeling and so forth. Um, over here on the left-hand side, remember the story. In the Bible, it goes like this. God makes Adam and Eve. He puts them in the Garden of Eden. He actually tells them to be fruitful and multiply. Um, but then he also tells them, don't eat out of this particular tree, the tree of knowledge or the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And after a time, Eve is tempted by a serpent uh, into trying the apple. And then she tempts Adam into trying the apple. So they're, the biblical story is really just a straightforward kind of transgression against what God told you to do and, and going against God's word. But as this story continues to get uh, interpreted uh, in Western culture, uh, more and more sexual innuendo, innuendo sorry, uh, enters into the story. Um, instead of it just being a transgression against God, in other words, it takes on the same flavor that I think it, you hear it today, which is Eve is the, the, the apple itself and the tree is a knowledge of sexual pleasure, frankly. Sexuality is fine in Christianity as long as it produces children, but the idea of having sex for just pleasure is something that even today Catholics, um, you know, don't agree with. It's always supposed to produce children, which is why there are all these rules against contraception in the Catholic Church much less so in the Protestant denominations of the church, of course. Um, 
And so if someone is just having sex for pleasure, then this is a questionable activity. And, and by the time that we're seeing here, it is an outright sin. That's the way they interpret it at this moment. And the story in the, the Garden of Eden becomes interpreted as more than just a transgression against God's uh, commandment, don't eat out of that tree. It becomes a story that is supposed to be understood as a metaphor for women's sexuality, women tempting men into doing things that they shouldn't do, sinful things, uh, and the fear of all of this, the fear of you know the sin that comes with all of this. So let, let's see how this is rendered in this particular work. And remember now, because we're looking at detailed paintings, kind of everything you see in these, these paintings uh, is probably important. So over here, Eve is uh, getting an, a piece of fruit, usually understood to be an apple, although it's not said to be an apple in the Bible, but that's the way they're interpreting it now, from a serpent. Notice really clearly that the serpent is a woman. So this is deviling down on the idea of whose fault it is. It's all woman's fault. Even the serpent is a woman here. She's got an apple in one hand, she's taking another apple. Notice how when the artist represents her form, he emphasizes the protruding abdomen here. That's a symbol of, uh, of sexuality. It's also a symbol of fertility uh, and emphasizes, for the time, rather large breasts here. Now, notice this as well. To make sure that we know that it's Eve's fault, if we move over to this scene of Eve tempting Adam, Adam's just minding his own business. Goodness knows what he's doing, but it looks like he was kind of down here smelling the flowers or something, going about his own business, following God's uh, you know, commandments about don't eat out of the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And here comes Eve tempting him with the apple. She is the agent here. She's the one who is the mover and the shaker, and he's just minding his own business. And also notice, and I'm, again, um, you know, I have to say these things, otherwise I wouldn't, but that the way that he's posed Adam, you can see his genitalia here. The artist didn't need to do that, but he wants to emphasize two things. Number one, before Adam and Eve eat of the uh, forbidden fruit here, they don't even know that they're naked. There is no sin. So being nude is not a bad thing. There's no sexuality or rather illicit sexuality involved in this. So he wants to show that. And the other thing is he wants to, of course, make us aware that there's something sexual that's about to occur. So he shows Adam's genitalia over here. Now, we don't see anything more than that, but we do see that the next scene on the other side of this cool contraption in the background, which is probably meant to be a kind of um, fountain of life symbol, that God uh, finds out about this, and he told them not to do it. It's frankly the one thing he told them not to do, and they're getting in trouble. He's caught them. And notice who's in the foreground again. Closest to us is Eve, and everything about God is focused on Eve. You know, in a way, yeah, Adam's going to get in trouble for going along with it, but we want to make sure that everyone understands it's Eve's fault here in the foreground. And then they're kicked out of the Garden of Eden, this kind of earthly paradise. Their punishments are that Adam will have to basically work for a living and that Eve's desires will be Adam's desires, which usually is interpreted that because it's her fault, uh, Adam gets to rule over her. And also she has a second punishment. She will have pain in childbirth, which again, emphasis this innuendo about sexuality. Now also notice at this point they're covering themselves up because they're ashamed of their nudity. They recognize that there's something sexual about this and that at this point sexuality has been associated with sin uh, and so they cover themselves up. Now moving to the northern renaissance proper in Flanders, so in the Flemish areas that are today Belgium primarily, which was an incredibly rich area of the world in the 15th century due to expanded trade uh, with both areas of Africa as well as areas of the Near and Far East. And of course, uh, Flanders has um, in Antwerp and elsewhere these beautiful big harbors that allow for a lot of boat trade that led to uh, you know, the explosion of the middle classes here and a lot of extraordinary art during this period. Now, one of the first things you probably notice, and we'll talk about 
the period stylistics here is that this is an incredibly detailed work, and it's not even that big of a work, frankly. The center panel is a little over two by three feet. Um, the very form of this, so to give you another term, is what's called a triptych. A triptych is a form of altarpiece, and altarpiece is set, as we remember, in front of an altar as an object of devotion that we look at when we are praying and thinking about God. And the triptych is one of the most famous forms. It has three separate panels, and those three, remember, correspond with the idea of the trinity. Here in the middle are hinges that actually allow this altarpiece to close in on itself so as to protect the paintings. Um, so the, the period style of the Northern Renaissance, remember period styles are um, a whole host of general characteristics of works of art produced within a particular culture in a particular time span that allow us to kind of in shorthand say, oh, that's got all the characteristics of the Northern Renaissance and we don't necessarily need to enumerate all of them. They're a kind of starting point for art history and remember the the premise of this is that because, you know, the work is produced by a culture with particular beliefs, those works of art will will reflect some of those beliefs and, and those, you know, that then um, shows up in these general characteristics that remain the same in works of art over a particular time period. This uh, altarpiece is, uh, was created by a man by the name of Robert Campan. He was for a long time known as the master of Flamand. Uh, and the painting itself is called the Maraud altarpiece. It is a uh, period style uh, of the Northern Renaissance. It's a really good example of this. So what is that period style? And how does it differ from the Italian early Renaissance? Well, number one, it is very naturalistic, just like we saw in Giotto's work and early Italian Renaissance works, but it has even more detail in it. That's the number one thing, a ton of naturalistic detail. One of the reasons that the Flemish artists are able to accomplish so much detail is that this is not a fresco painting. It is an oil painting. And oil paintings are quite different than the techniques we've seen so far in painting. Um, unlike a fresco where you're painting on wet plaster, or even a tempera painting in which the binder, the thing that holds the pigment to the board, these are all painted on gesso boards at this stage, um, in which in a tempera painting that binder is an animal protein, usually egg yolks, but every once in a while they are things like animal proteins such as milk proteins and so forth. Unlike that, in oil painting, the binder is oil, usually linseed oil, which is semi-transparent. And what it allows them to do is build up layers of what are called glazes of oil. You can paint a very bold color and then go back over that color with other layers of transparent oil paint and build up the form so that you get way more naturalistic detail than you would in a fresco painting. You also don't need to pet paint as you would in a fresco painting before anything dries. So the big difference in the look between an oil painting and a tempera or a fresco painting is that oil paintings are luminous. They have tons and tons of uh, light to them uh, and lots of glossiness, just like oil paints do today. Whereas tempera and fresco paintings are very, very flat. They look matte instead of uh, shiny and uh, illuminated. <clears throat> Second characteristic of Northern Renaissance paintings is that they tend to have a very, very crowded composition. This is a complicated way of saying something simple, which is er, there's a lot of stuff in here that in a Renaissance painting from Italy you wouldn't find. They just fill up the entire interior with lots and lots of little anecdotal details, which the Italians try to stay away from. Number three is that just about everything that you find in a Northern Renaissance work, even if it seems like an object that should be in that space, such as a book or a flower pot or a candle or whatever, these things are all symbols. They're part of the iconography of the work. So a mass amount of symbols in, uh, in the works of the Northern Renaissance is a common characteristic. 
And then number four, and this is not in every case, but very, very frequently, these works of art oftentimes set religious scenes within a contemporary uh, Northern Renaissance setting. In other words, we are looking at a scene, for instance, here of an Annunciation, but it's set in an interior that would look like a middle-class Flemish interior of the time. Just as if we go over here to Joseph's workshop, out through the window in the background is a contemporary Flemish city. It's probably Bruges, by the way. So those are the four general characteristics, and we'll pick up some of the specifics as we look through this work. I'm going to get us in close on the central panel here. Before you're starting to get familiar with this, and pretty soon we're going to do in one of our summary essays what's known as a compare and contrast essay, in which you look at two different renderings of the same subject, in this case the Annunciation, and you think about what makes those things different and what those differences mean. So we know the Annunciation is when the angel Gabriel comes to the Virgin Mary and announces to her that she will bear the Son of God, uh, the Messiah Christ on earth. And we see that occurring here. But we want to pick up what, what, what else is going on here. Why is it depicted this particular way? And the, the stylistics can help us to look for particular things. So number one, when we set something uh, well, naturalism is everywhere to be found. Let's start with this in order. Naturalism can be found in the rendering of what look like real figures in roughly believable space. Now, the artist is using a technique, he's not quite there yet, known as linear perspective. And I'll talk about this more when we get back to the Italians, and it's, it's really uh, in there. But linear perspective is a way to generate the illusion of three dimensions on a two-dimensional surface. And you should look this up in your textbook. All of these lines, for instance, here of the bench, um, recede back to one point in space, as do these lines here at the top of the fireplace recede back into one space. So it creates a much more kind of believable interior. They're like converging lines, like when you're a kid and you're drawing railroad tracks going into the different distance, although in this case, they all recede back to one uh, point in space. There's a lot of modeling of the faces, and you can see highlights on the drapery to show you there's a body underneath this. You know, lots and lots of naturalism in here. <laughs> Number two in the stylistics, tons of details, right? Everywhere you look, there's little anecdotal details from lions up here on the edges of the bench uh, to a candle and a book and flowers and some kind of what looks like a clean cleansing pot in the background, windows and a sky up here and so forth. Number three, and this is where we have to slow down and start looking at all of this, and you need to know all of this symbolism. The cool thing is that symbolism as long as you're within the same culture, because it's all built upon conventions of knowledge, um, there's nothing natural about them, but because they get used so frequently in paintings and sculptures and architecture, um, once you know them, you'll be able to find them everywhere, even in today's world. So while this might seem a lot to give you right off the bat, you're going to keep seeing these symbols over and over and over again, and they'll get very familiar to you. So I'm going to get us up even closer on this and, and show you some details. On the table in front or in between the angel Gabriel and the Virgin Mary is the Bible. And the Bible is actually kind of turning through its pages, but most of the, the words that are on here refer to the very passage of the Annunciation in which this is all occurring, or to the idea of purity or virginity. Remember, the, the you know, Mary is a virgin when this all occurs. On the table, you also see a candle. Now, single candles um, are very symbolic they're just one. They're kind of like a votive candle. When they are lit, they mean that something holy or something legal is occurring. And frankly, when something's holy, it's almost always legal as well. It's all protected by law. In this case, though, you have a candle that's been blown out. We can still see the wisp of smoke. One of the things that can tell us is that angel, the angel Gabriel has just come in on the scene. 
And with him came like a, you know, a little bit of wind with the opening of the door and it's blown out the candle. But the more important thing is to say that um, we don't need man-made light right now because Christ, who is God's light, is coming to illuminate our lives. That's the symbol here. Snuff candle in this context means God's light overshadows man-made light. In the vase, which also has its own symbolism having to do with purity, which you can read about in your text, is a lily. White lilies are always symbols in the West of purity. In this case, the virgin's virginity. Notice, though, that we have three blossoms. Three, of course, being the number of the Trinity. And to push this even further, notice how two of the blossoms have already opened and one is just still a bud. This is a symbol of the idea of God the Father, who is already alive, the Holy Spirit, who's already alive, and the Christ, who is just now a bud, but will be alive when Mary gives birth to him. So you see how prolific the symbolism is here. Go up to uh, up above the table, you see flying through this round window. Remember the round window, just like the rose window, is a symbol of God's eye looking over all things. We see flying through that window what looks like a, a little kind of ghost figure um, carrying on his shoulder a crucifix, you know, going on seven rays of light. Seven is a very symbolic number as well. It's about the seven joys and sorrows of the Virgin Mary. And what we have here is the Holy Spirit coming through the window at exactly the same moment that the angel Gabriel is telling the Virgin Mary that she will become pregnant. Now, here's the symbolism. Um, it's about virginity, just as rays of light pass through a window without breaking it. So the Holy Spirit or the light of God enters Mary without disturbing her virginity. Everyone get that one? Uh, yeah, it's a symbol of, uh, of her purity, of her virginal aspect. Rays of light pass through both her and windows in the same manner. Uh, to impregnate her without disturbing her virginity. <clears throat> in the background, in this niche, is this beautiful, beautiful pot full of water. Anytime you see clear water, it's almost always a symbol of purity, right? Like baptism is a way that Christians purify themselves in that ritual. Uh, however, in this case, it's like holy water again, um, but it's meant to reference something that most of you won't be aware of, but you need to for the purposes of this class. In churches, there are these little vestibules that are set up for the priest to go purify himself before conducting mass, and they're called sacristies. Um, this is on your lecture guide, S-A-C-R-I-S-T-Y, a sacristy, which is a place to purify oneself. This is, of course, associated with the church, just as the Virgin Mary is associated with the church, as we've talked about before. And if this little towel here looks quite a bit like a priest stole, you know, that symbolic symbol of his office, it's because it's meant to allude to that. Up on the end of the banister uh, of this kind of towel rack here is this thing here, which is kind of like a gargoyle. It's what's known as an apotropaic device, A-P-O-T-E-R-O-P-A-I-C, apotropaic, which means uh, a symbol that is meant to ward off evil. And just about every home had these things all around it to ward off e evil tidings. Then, you know, nothing's not symbolic here. The windows are open, but they only look at the sky. This is to emphasize the spirituality of all things. And you can probably see, moving away from symbolism, how all the rafters of this roof all recede back to a central point here, showing you that perspective. I'm going to actually back up here and look around here. I'm not going to overwhelm you with symbols. We could keep going on all day. But I will say, if you're wondering about the decor here, like, why would this bench go with this table? It doesn't look like it fits. Some of you probably recognize this looks suspiciously like a church pew. Um, and so it's emphasizing the association of the Virgin Mary with the church again. 
going one step further, the lions on this, both on the tops here as well as on the foot down here below, is a symbolic illusion. Illusions are things that make us think about something else. Not illusion, but illusion. A-L-L-U-S-I-O-N. It is a symbolic allusion to the throne of King Solomon the Wise, who had lion's feet on his throne. So it's about wisdom. And then you actually see up here one lit candle, a symbol that something holy or something religious is occurring. Notice how this uh, you know, candle holder doesn't have anything, but this one does. So those are all the symbols in here. Now let's talk about something else about this work. When we're looking at works of art, we also want to be thinking about how the form elements of that work of art work. Uh, formal elements are things like line and shape and color and texture and space and so forth. And so one of the things that I can kind of make us think about here early on as we start to practice um, formal analysis is, you know, what is the place that our eye goes first? What's called a focal point? In this case, you'll notice over and over again, it's the Virgin Mary. Now, why does this occur? Well, one of the reasons that occurs is that the implied lines, not actual lines, but lines created by looking or pointing gestures, such as Angel Gabriel looking at him, the lines of uh, the light coming through the window pointing at her, the hand gesture all points at her, that helps to make her the focal point. The other thing, though, that makes her the focal point is that she faces us. She's not in profile like Gabriel. She faces us, which is a much more commanding position. It demands our attention. And then number three, she's in red. And red, with its longer wavelength, stands out a lot more than blues that seem to fade into the background here. So those all help to make her the focal point. Now, it might seem awkward that she's like sitting on the floor here, but as you will have read of in your text, this is a symbol of her humility before God. She doesn't take herself to be super important. She's on the ground, basically almost kneeling uh, in the presence of the divine. We'll keep adding greater and greater degrees of formal analysis to our works as we go forward. Move over then to um, the work up. Um, some things have changed. First of all, you can probably tell we don't have all the bright colors. There's not, um, you know, it's a much smaller scene. It's making sure that we understand that Joseph is a little less important than the Virgin Mary, um, for sure, just as we saw in Shadow's work. It also focuses us in on the idea, as was in the other work, that, um, you know, this is almost like it's taking place in a contemporary Flemish setting. And this makes Northern Renaissance works really relatable, right? It, it pitches the story as if it's taking place in your world. Like, can you imagine this taking place right now in the world in which you live? Um, and it emphasizes in Joseph's place the everyday mundane realm, the worldly wor world of working hard and perfecting yourselves and doing the best you can at your job, which is part of the humanism. If Mary's work was all about the spiritual, she's the epitome of the spiritual purity idea, Joseph's a hard-working guy who epitomizes the humanistic ideal. And in the background, um, instead of seeing a sky, as we saw on the Virgin Mary side, we see a contemporary Flemish town focusing on the everyday world. Joseph is rendered much more naturalistically. He's not made to look particularly beautiful. He's an everyday guy. And everywhere in his picture are symbols as well. What he's doing right now is he's uh, drilling out holes in what is a wine press. That wine press will be used to crush grapes and to create wine. And wine is associated, as we said last time, with the sacrament of the Christian Holy Communion, that Last Supper idea where Christ turns the wine on the table into his blood and turns the bread in the table into his body. So that's one of the things going on there, symbolism. Move up to the table, and I'm sorry this slide isn't fantastic. You'll see a couple of things. Number one, there are nails up here. Now, nails would be in a carver shop, but because we've chosen to pick these everywhere, you're probably thinking, 
and they, uh, you know, all, they're all around this table. You're probably thinking, well, that reminds me of the nails that were used to nail Christ to the cross, which is different than the ways that people were generally crucified. Also on the table is a mouse trap, and on the window another mouse trap. Now this is a very, very particular understanding of one of the reasons Christ came to Earth that you find all over Northern Europe. It comes from a, a famous um, idea that was started in the Middle Ages, which is Christ was born, and and he would. The reason, one of the reasons he was born, is that it would so uh, peak the curiosity of Satan that he would have to come see what this was all about and we could trap him or trap his sin. And so mouse traps became a symbol of Christ being a way to trap the sins of the devil. And you see one here and one here. And then you also see, and I'm going to back up a little bit here, completely displayed in the foreground once again, in any carpenter shop, a big hatchet and a saw here. These are symbols of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah from the Old Testament is widely considered to be by Christians the first Old Testament prophet to foretell the coming of Christ. And his symbols are the axe or the saw because he was martyred, put to death for his beliefs by being cut in half. In some of the stories with an axe, in other stories with a saw. So that's how we allude to that. If you move over that Flemish town, a little bit of a close-up, and again, this is a tiny little scene, so all that naturalistic detail uh, out the window is something that you find a lot of in the north and far less of in Italy. If you move over to the other scene on the other side, to the left-hand side of the trip here, you see the patrons, and the patrons are the people who paid for this work of art. Now, they're not included in the actual scene, but it's like they've got private viewing of the scene, looking through the window, or I'm sorry, the door, through which we would imagine Gabriel just went through and witnessing the Annunciation, making it very, very relatable. In the, fore, uh, in the front is the man who gets to see the scene. This is the way that the gender, uh, you know, ideas about gender were at the time. Men were more important, so they're put in front, and the woman is behind him looking down demurely. Remember how this corresponds with the way they interpret the Garden of Eden, for instance. In the background is a man who may or may not be the artist himself, uh, depicting himself. And remember why people do this. It's an expiatory offering, a way to assuage one's uh, sins during life, to expiate or wipe them away. And then finally, one last symbolism here uh, is a, a walled, enclosed area referencing an you know, expensive home. But notice this flower there. That, once again, is the hortus conclusus, or enclosed garden, an area which is filled with vibrant, lush foliage, flowers, which you can see in the foreground as well, flowers back here, but is walled off from the rest of the world. And a hortus conclusus or enclosed garden is a symbol of virginity. So it corresponds perfectly with the subject of this work of art. I'm going to pause for a minute and get a drink of water, and I'll be right back with another uh, work of art from the Northern Renaissance. Okay, so among the most famous of all the Northern Renaissance artists of this period, Jan and Hubert van Eyck, uh, they owned a huge workshop, and Jan van Eyck is probably the most famous artist of the early Northern Renaissance. You're looking at right here the, the very, very famous uh, monument and altarpiece that is known as the Ghent altarpiece, Produced around 1432, although it would have taken many, many years to produce this. Um, it's huge. It's 12 feet tall or so. And if you saw the famous movie Monuments Men about the Nazis stealing Western artworks, this was one of the most famous works of art that the Nazis stole and was recovered after the war. Um, it's, as I said, an altarpiece again. This is the closed version. In this case, it's not a triptych. It has multiple different panels. And when... An altarpiece has multiple panels. We call it a polyptych, poly for many, and uh, you know the rest for the altarpiece part. 
Uh, in this scene, you can probably see already there are some things that you will be familiar with. Um, right in this kind of central area is the scene of the Annunciation again. And over here is the angel Gabriel, and he is speaking the words that are literally written on the surface of this, although they're written backwards as if they could be read by God is usually the, the way that people understand this. Um, and span the space to the Virgin Mary over on this side, uh, who is hearing those words and showing her devotion to things. In between, you see a scene of a contemporary Flemish town again, and here you see a scene of a sacristy again. And let's get up close here for a minute. Gabriel holding in his hand a lily with three lilies on it, saying these words, and they span the space over here to the Virgin Mary. And this is a new weird hat that she's wearing. This is, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit who has landed on her, and she is uh, witnessing, uh, you know, the divine here. I think she's supposed to be looking up at him. Off to the side, you see the sacristy again. So that symbolism, again, is really straightforward. In a way, it's like the word of Gabriel passes um, through from heaven to the material realm, represented by a contemporary uh, Flemish town. Um, it shows up prominently in the church, just like we learned with Abbot Suget and the Lux Nova, or idea of divine light, rays of light of God passing into the church, make it a holy space. And of course, all of this becomes, God becomes human uh, through the Annunciation when he becomes Christ here. the bottom, the patron saints, by the way, painted in grisaille again, these gray tones, of the church, John the Baptist over here, John the Evangelist over here, and then we see on each side um, the patrons, the people who paid for this, including themselves in the scene. Remember how this works. They're expiatory offerings uh, meant to show God who devoted so much time and expense to glorify him and teach his word to everyone. When you open this scene up, this is what you see, and it's a massive amount of detail uh, in this scene, and I'll keep getting us closer and closer on this, but if you think that this is Christ as God in heaven uh, after his resurrection, if you think that this is basically life-size, you've got a pretty good idea of the scale here. It's not quite that big, but it's just about that big. And the subject up above is... Um, Christ in the center as God in heaven, blessing us all. He is associated with the Pope. Uh, he's wearing a crown that looks quite a bit like the uh, Pope's tiara. And then down below is another crown associating him with not only the king of heaven and of religion, but the king of the earth. On his right hand side, so made more important, is Mary now sitting in heaven as queen of heaven. Once again, reading a consecrated Bible, but now crown. And on his left is John the, uh, John the Baptist. You'll always be able to tell John the Baptist because his iconography is that he'll be wearing animal furs and he always has really unruly, unkempt hair and a beard because he was an ascetic. He was somebody who devote, devoted his entire life to the contemplation of the divine and so he didn't care anything about how he looked. On each side of them are choirs of angels. And these choirs of angels, on the one hand, reference the idea of different orders of angels in heaven, but they are also meant to look like the choirs and the instruments that were used in the church so as to glorify God. And then on each side of them are Adam and Eve. At the bottom is something we're not going to spend a lot of time with. At the bottom is a scene of uh, something called the Golden Mass. It's an adoration of an apparition of Christ as a lamb on an altar where all the masses, including saints and peasants and everyone, come to venerate him. Instead, let me just show you this. Let's just get up close on this, right? Looking at God there here, as Jesus says God here in heaven, and you can probably tell how naturalistic this looks. I mean, everything looks completely believable, and there's tons of detail everywhere in this picture. It looks photo, photographic, right? It's just like the most 
believable rendering you can imagine at this stage. And the details don't stop uh, there. I mean, after you get more details, you'll be able to see here. No longer has a halo, but you can probably see that his head is kind of emanating these rays of light. And if you get us in, on the crown that's about this big in the picture, look at all that detail. Every single little pearl and piece of gold uh, and jewel all is illuminated perfectly. We've got all this pearl work spelling out words from the Bible and the glorification of God at the hem of his cloak. Of these small little things these are about the size of a pinhead and they still have tons and tons of detail there very very meticulous detailed work which we expect from the northern renaissance the, the mary again symbols in her crown are the lily a symbol of her purity and roses uh, symbols of her passion for christ she's once again reading the bible because she's so pure and this is Interesting. I think of this mainly because when we get back to the Italians, and they're less interested in naturalism and much more into idealism, you won't see a representation of the first human this way at all. This is Adam, and you know he looks like an everyday guy. He's not made to look any better or worse than everyday people. He's just your everyday naturalized guy. When we get to the Italians, they'll want to make him more perfect than this. Eve over here, she's not holding a, um, an apple. She's holding a fig, which is another common fruit associated with the fall. And she's got the protruding abdomen, again, a symbol of her sexuality, or maybe even that she's pregnant here. And once again, we don't make her look perfect. We make her look like an everyday person, very natural. That will change with the Italians below just to show you this a little bit um, based upon a mystical vision uh, mystical visions are something of course that mystics who are very close to God supposedly have of an apparition of Christ in the form of a sacrificial lamb bleeding into a golden chalice which is a symbol of the Eucharist or making his uh, the wine into his blood and all of the masses venerating him because, of course, this all symbolizes um, our possibility of getting into heaven. Very quickly, no for sure, but most people are pretty sure the text is uh, not quite uh, sure about this. But uh, it stands to reason that this is a self portrait of Jan van Eyck. And, you know, it's got all that naturalistic detail. He's wearing a red turban that's probably a symbol of him being an artist, looking back out at us, showing his consummate skill. And on uh, when he signed this, he actually wrote on it, instead of Jan van Eyck made this, he wrote, Jan van Eyck, the best that I am able to do, which is a, a very, very humanistic thing. Even artists are striving to be the best artists that they can be, so that they follow God's uh, commandment to be the best that you can be in whatever your profession is. My favorite work by Jan van Eyck, famous double portrait, sometimes known as the Arnolfini double portrait, other times it's known as the Arnolfini wedding portrait, because most people think that this is probably about a wedding. The reason that this is so interesting to me is that not only is it filled with massive amounts of detail and crazy amounts of skill and, and tons and tons of symbolism, but a lot of that symbolism is very gendered. It tells you what people thought about the roles of the different genders of their time. So let's start with the subject. The subject is, uh, you know, a very, very wealthy middle class family. Uh, Giovanni Arnolfini, the guy, uh, was someone who administered to the Medici banks in Bruges. Um, so he is, and you'll learn more about the Medici family next week and the week after and the week after that. Frankly, they're a big family name. They're one of those really, really powerful Italian middle class families. It's a new series on them on Netflix, for instance, that helped fund much of the uh, Renaissance, particularly in Florence. And then later they'll vote their way into office as popes and start creating things in Rome as well. So he worked for them and he probably made bank, right? This guy was making tons of money. And he's marrying, or we think that's probably what's going on, this war woman, Giovanna. Um, who came from a little bit lower class than him, 
and that's actually encoded in this work of art in various ways. Now, um, the portrait, if it is a wedding, is showing them in the midst of the ceremony. And one of the reasons we think that this is an actual wedding and not just a commemorative work is up here above it is Jean Van Eyck's signature, and it says, Jean Van Eyck was here. And I'll show you a close-up of this, but this little um, convex mirror in the background shows the entire scene of this interior from the back to the front, as if you are seeing the entire thing in this. It's only about this big in the actual painting, from the back to the front here. And in that scene, you see Jan van Eyck, a man with a red turban, and another man probably administering the wedding. Weddings didn't take place, by the way, in churches at this time. They tended to take place in homes. And it would be particularly appropriate for this to be taking place in the most private component of the home, the bedchamber, because marriages were about uniting a couple so that they could reproduce more, more children, and particularly Christian children. So then let's look at some of the symbolism. We'll start with the easy stuff, and then I'll keep showing you details. Number one, um, so uh, first of all, I should just say all of the symbolism has to do with wealth. Everything you're seeing here is an exquisite amount of wealth from the fashions that they're wearing to the bed that they have to the beautiful mirror they have in the background to the chandelier to this expensive kind of dog. All of this is wealth. And that wealth is symbolic of someone, um, you know, doing what God wanted them to do and being rewarded for doing what God wanted them to do, perfecting themselves with material wealth. But the specific symbols, if we work our way through it, are if you look at the chandelier, in the chandelier there is only one candle. And that candle, of course, when you have a single candle, means something religious or something holy is occurring. In this case, probably a wedding. In the foreground, I'll show you a close-up of this guy, is a dog. Now, dogs in the West are almost always a symbol of fidelity. Dogs are loyal to us. So here they are getting married, and you've got a symbol of loyalty or fidelity. But that dog has two more kind of symbolisms to it. The first is that it's a very rare breed, an affin pincher, which means it's about wealth again. And, of course, some of you know that dogs are pretty frisky. They can, you know, especially unneutered males can jump up on your leg and do all kinds of things. And that's, in the Norse, something that they playfully would have wanted people to think about, that once these two get married, they will retire to that bed and, and get a little frisky. Um, and then more symbolism. We're going to move us in closer on some of these things so we can see them better. You're probably noticing that if you're wondering what these are, these are their house slippers, their shoes. And here are hers in the background. They've taken these off. And every time you see someone standing barefoot, or just about every time, it's a symbol that something religious is occurring. It's called standing on holy ground. And it comes directly out of the Bible that when you're on holy ground, you take off your shoes to, so as to be closer to the spirit of God. That's one of the things occurring here closer here again this mirror is small and yet it's got all of the detail to show you the entire scene that's the back of Giovanni back of Giovanna and then you see a man with a red turban and another man over here presiding over what we assume to be the marriage ceremony all of these little scenes and these are about the size of a dime are scenes from what are known as the Stations of the Cross. So they're all moments of Christ leading up to his crucifixion, which is at the top. This is a signature that says Johann von Eich für her, which means Johann von Eich was here. On his side are prayer beads, like a rosary. Um, and why are they on his side? Because prayer beads are used when you're out and about. And you can't necessarily get to the church as often as you would like or get to a private chapel. And so you work your way through your prayers. And that's to say, being a man, he's out and about administering to his affairs. And, and so he's going to need his prayer beads. On her side is a broom and the patron saint of women in childbirth right here at the top of the bed, St. Margaret. And so what does this mean? Well, she's too wealthy to actually clean up the home, 
but she will be in charge of making sure that the servants clean up the home. That's the broom. And of course, her main job as a wife is to reproduce. Uh, and so you've got the patron saint of women in childbirth on her side. Right above their hands is another apotropaic figure, uh, uh, kind of like a little gargoyle meant to ward off evil so that they have a, a good and productive marriage. Havana, yeah, very beautiful. She's wearing everything she's wearing is of the latest style fashionable lace, uh, beautiful ermine trimmed green velvet cloak, all tons of wealth. Um, a lot of people note that it looks like she's pregnant already. Well, that's the style of the time, believe it or not. Um, to emphasize the idea of women's uh, capability to create children, they used to have these bodices that actually protruded out from the abdomen and emphasized that. I know a lot of women today are like, why, not, why isn't that the style now? Um, you don't have to hide any kind of belly fat or anything. It's actually seen as a symbol of um, your ability to bear children here. Giovanni, let's say a little bit attractive than her. The standard stereotype applies. He's got boatloads of money and so he's able to marry the young hottie here. Um, looking though, uh, you know, like like he probably looked, very naturalistic, not trying to idealize him much at all. Look at other parts of this painting. There's a few more details that are worth pointing out. On her side, the bed, very red, a symbol of passion. Um, that's, of course, where she will be to produce children. And on his side, the open window, uh, a symbol of him being out and about in the world, including the fruit that's on the, um, the both the, the windowsill as well as this bench over here, a couple of which are oranges. Now, this is a weird esoteric symbol, but oranges were known as the Mala Medica, M-A-L-A -A Medica, M E D. I C A, the medicinal apple. And the last part of that, Medica, sounds a lot like Medici, which is the family that he worked for. And it may be a subtle allusion to that, that he works for this famous family, uh, that he wants to be, have that included in there. If nothing else, it symbolizes the idea of fertility once again. Um, notice how it's, it's, these are particularly right around his waist level. It's his side of the fertility. Um, compliment. So tons of symbolism, tons of naturalism, lots of details in this, and of course the whole thing being gendered according to the um, the views of the day about what each gender's role was supposed to be. Foreground, those slippers again, look at all that detail. Um, they're actually wooden uh, house slippers in his case and hers in the background. And the cute bargain affin pin back out at us, a symbol of uh, for, uh, fidelity. Chandelier up above with a single candle in it, a symbol of something holy or something sacred. I'm sorry, something legal happening. Now, what is the other interpretation of this? If it's not a wedding, a lot of people believe it could be a something that's to be almost like a visual document saying that if he goes out in the town and gets hurt, um, she, her child, this is the interpretation that she's with child already, uh, will inherit his wealth. She wouldn't be able to. Um, the wealth always goes through male uh, parts of the family at this stage, but if she's pregnant, she her child will receive as well. So it's kind of like a visual document or will um, in that interpretation, which is less, um, uh, scholars tend to believe that less than the idea that this is a wedding. Those fruit, oranges and apples. And, you know, I spent a lot of time on those works. I don't want to give you too long of a lecture. I just want to show you a few other works. And, and I'm going to go through these fairly quickly. Um, one of the very famous artists of this time period is Roger van der Weyden. In a way, Roger van der Weyden is much more um, like the, the kind of Gothic style uh, than some of the artists we've seen so, f so far here, like Campan or Van Eyck in that he tends to focus in on beautiful decorative patterning. And you see in this work called uh, The Deposition, 
and there are a lot of depositions. That just means taking Christ down off of the cross. Um, he tends to focus more on the decorative qualities than a really believable uh, figure in space. Although all of his figures look realistic, that kind of gold weird background that doesn't seem very uh, realistic, it's very common in his work. Um, in this case, remember taking people down off of the cross, taking Christ down off the cross is the moment before the lamentation scene or a pieta scene, as we'll see going forward. And one of the things that uh, you know, I want to use this work to point out uh, are the ways that the artist creates a beautiful scene out of something that's a pretty sad subject, right? And what I mean by that is not only are the beautiful colors used here all over the place, but look at Christ's body. Um, it's not beaten and tortured. It's sure it's got a gash on the side and it's definitely got holes here and here, but it doesn't look like it's been on a cross forever. It's had the crap beat out of him. He's made to look really, really beautiful, and he's made of this beautiful S-curve, right? Which is a really soothing form. And then notice how the artist has mirrored that S-curve with the same S-curve in the body of the Virgin Mary, who has fainted at the scene. Now, this is really common as well. The Virgin Mary, by the time Christ has been crucified, if she was 14 when he was born, and if he died somewhere around the age of 34, she's got to be in her late 40s, and yet she looks pretty good for that. It's not uncommon to idealize the Virgin Mary all the way through this period, uh, whether you're in the north or the south. But particularly when we get to Italy, you'll see her idealized over and over again. The other thing I wanted to talk about, though, is the iconography. There are going to be ways for you to tell who is who, over and over again in these works of art, either because they're included over and over again or because they have particular iconography. So we can tell that the Virgin Mary is the Virgin Mary for two reasons. Number one, she's in blue, right? She will become queen in heaven. Number two, her body rhymes that of Christ as if they're both from the same flesh, which they are. They're both understood to have been born of God. Because John the Evangelist will always be in these scenes, and because we know that John the Evangelist was tasked with taking care of the Virgin Mary after Christ's death, we can recognize that this is John the Evangelist. He is taking care of her more than anyone else. He's closest to her, and frankly, he's the youngest of the apostles, so that's another way to tell who he is. Over here at his feet, once more, a very, very important figure, Mary Magdalene. Remember, she'll often be at his feet crying. Her hair is all bound up. Her hair is a symbol of her, her sexuality. In the story of the Bible, the Mary Magdalene figure, of course, when she first meets Christ, she is understood to be a prostitute, a fallen woman, repenting her sins, and she falls at his feet and cries at his feet and wipes away the the dirt from his feet with her hair and her tears. Her hair, as in all Western art, long flowing, beautiful hair on women as a symbol of their um, sexuality, um, is something that is identified with her because she was once a prostitute. But here it's all bound up to symbolize the fact that she is penitent or repentant of her sins. But notice how her cloak falls down as if it were hair. The scarf falls down like it's hair, and she's crying there. And then right next to her, although she's not holding it, right next to her is this jar of oils that she will use to wash Christ's feet or anoint his feet during the crucifixion. Lesser characters that you don't need to remember for today, but they will show up again. Joseph of Arimathea is usually represented at the crucifixion. He's usually the one who's dressed in the nicest clothes because he was a very wealthy man. And then Nicodemus was always also at the uh, crucifixion, and you'll see him there as an older man in less wealthy clothes than Joseph. I'll show you a couple steps of this. Mary has literally fainted. Yes, she's near a skull again, which is a symbol of the place where Christ was crucified, Golgotha, as well as the idea of fixing the original sin of Adam so as to give us everlasting life. His feet, Magdalene, I might also point out, look at how kind of tight-fitting her clothing is to emphasize, you know, um, 
her body and to emphasize the idea that at once she was a prostitute, a very beautiful woman uh, by all uh, interpretations of this time. I'll show you again, we don't look at a lot of these scenes, but this is a work by Roger van der Weyden called Just Portrait of a Lady. Um, that the way that artists made the vast majority of their money was through portraiture. Here's just one of those wealthy um, middle-class women having her portrait painted by this man. Um, it is, on the one hand, very um, naturalistic. It looks like a real figure. As your text points out, there are things that seem idealized. Uh, the full lips, the very, very almond eyes. But the only way we could tell she was idealized, because we don't have photographs of what she looked like, is to look at other Roger van der Weyden paintings and realize over and over again he gives all of his women pretty full lips, lips and very almond eyes. And in passing, I wanted to show you a really complex work by Roger van der Weyden, uh, which is known as the Last Judgment Altarpiece, which was actually created for a hospital where many people were dying, and of course, to keep them believing in Christ, they were they would be brought in front of this polyptic, it's a multi-panel altarpiece, to be reminded that the last judgment is coming uh, and that they will all be judged for good and evil. It's basically set up in a pretty standard way with Christ as the judge on top. The archangel Michael, though, in this case, is weighing the souls. He's got the scale in his hand. We've seen this going back to the tympanum of San Lazar, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and then over here on his right are the little bit more important people, including the Virgin Mary and saints and apostles and former popes. And over here, John the Baptist again and other saints and apostles and even Mary Magdalene over here. And then on the right hand side are all the people being drawn from their tombs uh, to ascend to heaven. And they're being entered into the promised realm over here that looks suspiciously like a Catholic church. Whereas the condemned, those sinners, are being cast into the fiery pits of hell over here. And I'll show you a couple of close-ups of this. And in the center, really standard iconography, the weighing of souls. If it goes up, like his hand, you're going to heaven. If it's going down, you're going to hell. Jesus sitting up above, weighing them all. Archangel, kind of his emissary. <laughs> Scenes of people being cast into hell here for various reasons, dragged by their hair, um, you know, screaming and crying, and finally recognizing the error of their ways, but it's too late at this point. Whereas those who have been um, religious will be drawn into heaven. The work for this week is another gigantic altarpiece called the Portinari Altarpiece by Hugo Vandergoes. Um, it's a work that was created for an Italian family who was working out of uh, Flanders again. They were actually, again, attached to the Medici family. Um, so they had big banks up there to make money off of the, the trade that was in the north. It's once again a triptych, a three-paneled altarpiece. This one's humongous. The center panel is, you know, uh, eight by 12 or so, so a big, huge work. And the subject matter is in the center. We have a scene called, an, it's an adoration scene, but it's a very particular adoration scene. Again, a mystic by the name of St. Bridget had a vision at one point, I think it's in the 12th century, of Christ lying on the ground with beams of light shooting from his body while all of the people admired him. And so instead of being in a manger or in a grotto in St. Bridget's mystical vision, Christ lies right on the ground to emphasize the idea of him being part of the earth, you know, part of the very creation of God, uh, but still, you know, special because he's emanating all this light while the, uh, you know, his, his people, his followers circle around him and glorify him. On the left-hand side of the panel are the, the people who commission this, the patrons, so Tommaso Portinari is right here and his sons down here below. Um, above them are their patron saints. So this is St. Thomas and this is St. Anthony for young Anthony over here. You'll notice there's another kid in here. He doesn't have a patron saint. And that's because this kid was born later after the painting was already done. And so there's enough room to kind of paint his head in there, but not get the patron 
a saint in this scene either. Whereas on this side, same things going on. Um, these are, uh, you know, the, the the wife and her daughter and their patron saints here uh, as well. In the center panel, which we'll do all of our attention on, basically an adoration scene. And just like Northern Renaissance paintings, you see tons and tons of detail, a kind of crowded composition with lots of stuff in there. Um, lots of naturalism. People look very, very believable. Uh, and tons and tons of symbolism in here. So the focal point of the whole painting is, of course, Christ in the center. All the implied lines of everyone looking and pointing point towards Christ. So your eye is going to keep going back there to Christ. The second most important figure, of course, is the Virgin Mary, who takes up all of this space and is also right in the center of this picture. And so she draws our attention to her. Her hands are in the form of like a little heart that point down to Christ. You know, we do this all the time uh, today. Lots of cele celebrities do this. And then as we move around the circle, hopefully you can recognize some of these figures by this point. These are the shepherds. You know, they are meant to look a little bit goofy and um, yokelish, frankly, because the idea is that even the low, uneducated masses understood that this is the Messiah. So you see them there. Um, coming in the far distance, you can't see it in this scene, are the three magi. They'll be here a little bit later. Over on this side, you have the ox and the ass again, symbols of the Old and the New Testament. I'm sorry, the New and the Old Testament. The ass is the old and the ox is the new. And also the idea that even animals recognize Christ as the Messiah. This is Joseph, again, off to the side, not as prominent, but still in the scene. And then if you're wondering about all these diminutive figures all around, who's you know, these are all angels. In this case, they all have wings. But anytime you see something that's a little bit smaller than other figures, even if they don't have wings, and frankly, um, oftentimes the gender or sex of angels is really hard to tell. They look very androgynous, either pretty men or, you know, um, you can't quite tell who they are. That's a, a pretty good indicator that they are angels. So then, what about some of the symbolism? Well, the big symbolism is here in the foreground. I'll come to that in a minute. But you can probably see in the background, on purpose, in this archway of this big building um, that goes right over the head of the Virgin Mary. That's a symbol of, on the one hand, Mary as Queen of Heaven, underneath the Dome of Heaven. But you could probably barely make this out. There's also a harp here over the doorhead and the lintel. And that harp is a symbol of King David. King David is the first major king of the Israelites. And remember in the tree of Jesse windows in the Gothic cathedrals, um, they, you know, French monarchs in particular trace their ancestry back through the line of Mary all the way back to King David to to justify their divine right to rule. And so this is associating the lineage of Mary with the Old Testament uh, Jewish kings. In the foreground, then, these other symbols. So, and this is much more like the colors of the actual work. Very, very vibrant, beautiful work. You see Jesus lying nude on the ground, kind of emanating this glowing light, almost like a mandorla that you'd see on a medieval tympanum angels on each side. They all look a little bit different because the angels come from different orders of the angels and then very prominently displayed. And, and look up all the other, uh, you know, details of the symbolism of this in your textbook. It goes into detail on this, um, is a big uh, kind of sheave of wheat. This is all wheat. And wheat is important. It has two symbolisms to it. The place that Jesus was born was Bethlehem, that literally means house of bread. And of course, we use wheat to make bread. So it's a, a symbol that tells you where he is born. But wheat as well is used to make bread. And bread in the Last Supper becomes Christ's body. And Christ's body, and you can see the, the golden rays of light are the exact same color as the gold of the wheat here, which is also here, um, is symbolic of the idea that uh, you know, in the ceremony of the Holy Communion, you're actually taking Christ into yourself. 
uh, and that emphasizes that. Um, the wine side of this whole thing is on this particular kind of jar that is associated with medicinal use, again, um, and Abarello is what it's called, uh, are, um, are grapes. And so grapes are associated with the wine part of the Eucharistic cer ceremony. And then, of course, we have all of these flowers. Now, people have interpreted these things slightly differently uh, through the years, uh, but it's roughly the same. You see here lilies again, and there's two that are blooming and one barely getting ready to bloom in the background. It started, and there's Christ at the beginning of his life there. Um, up here, you see a purple iris. Purple irises are symbols of uh, royalty. Uh, down here below, uh, you see red carnations. Red carnations, uh, in this case, are a symbol of the Trinity. There are three of these here. Uh, over here, um, the red lily, which is a symbol of the, um, the blood of Christ, uh, the fact that he is going to die and be reborn. And then finally, you have these seven blue columbines. And blue columbines are usually associated with the with sorrow. Um, so if you think of the Columbine massacre, you might be able to remember this. Um, and and of course, Mary's going to have her sorrows in this life, as we all will, you know, as Christ, uh, you know, enters life and dies for us and so forth. So that's the major symbolism of this. There's a up of those flowers again. And here are the scenes on the outside. When you're looking this up, I won't, I won't give you the story of this, but you can figure this out pretty quickly. Uh, over here, again, the patrons and their patron saints, except for this poor boy who was born too late. You see um, various scenes in the background, them leaving Bethlehem. It's a composite narrative over here. Or the three magi coming into the scene from the distance over here. Um, this is the thing that I'd like you to look up. The patron saint of this woman, whose name I won't tell you, um, was a patron saint because of a dragon. And you see that dragon down there below. So if you want to figure out who her patron saint was, look up the saint who, um, who tamed or killed a dragon and you'll figure that out. Well, I hope you've had fun this week. Um, you know, the Northern Renaissance is really cool if you love symbolism and if you love all that detail. And when we return to Italy, you're going to see a lot of the detail, although it's going to be much, much more kind of simplified versions of it, but almost none of the symbolism. The Italians didn't like the symbolism as much. So I will see you next week.